Extraterrestrial pandemics, obviously that's not very likely. On the other hand, grooming emergencies are extremely possible if you don't have the right equipment. Fortunately, this video is brought to you by Manscaped, the premium brand for men's hygiene products. Look, if you've watched this channel for a while, you know that I enjoy the Manscaped product line. And right now, this is an exciting time because Manscaped have actually just released their fourth generation trimmer, this thing, the new Lawnmower 4.0. Boom. I added on travel safe mode, which is something I'll tell you about in just a second. <laughs> Boom. There you go. Easy. So what this Lawnmower 4.0 has is advanced ceramic blades at the top with something called skin safe technology, which uh, reduces nicks and cuts. And look, you don't want to get nicks and cuts on your face or for me, my head when I shave. But where you really don't want them is where this thing's designed to go. Okay, so that skin safe technology is something very nice. You can also swap out the blade get a nice fresh one in there so you know you're not going to run into any trouble. It's also cordless and waterproof so you can trim in the shower. Battery lasts for 90 minutes off a single charge which is pretty incredible and when you do want to charge it up you just pop it in this cradle thing. There's no uh, there's no like uh, plugs or anything in the bottom it's just wirelessly charged you know because it's waterproof you use it in the shower you kind of need that. But it's also extremely convenient. So if you want to start looking good from head to toe with no pair of stones left unturned, please go to manscaped.com forward slash brain food and get 20% off. That's manscaped.com forward slash brain food or there's a link in the description below and let's get into it. A huge percentage of the human population not living in a cave on July the 20th, 1969, were aware of the moments when Neil Armstrong first stepped on the moon and uttered the words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. They also cheered just as jubilantly when Armstrong and crewmates Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins landed in the Pacific Ocean just four days later. But what happened after that? Did they get back to their families? Did they enjoy a nice sleep on their own beds? Did they immediately get escorted to the White House? Well, no. Instead, the three astronauts were whisked off to a secure facility where they were quarantined with almost no contact with Earth's atmosphere between July the 24th and August the 10th. The reason was a fear of cross-contamination between the Apollo astronauts and whatever might have existed on the moon. Despite the abundance of glorious B-level science fiction films from that decade, our scientific abilities were strong enough in 1958, the year NASA was established, to feel pretty sure that there were no little green men on the moon, but it couldn't be said for certain, especially when talking about the microbial variety. Starting in March of 1959 with the 13-pound probe Pioneer 4, NASA had sent a string of satellites to our little orbiting rock to send back data, but they never obtained physical samples of the moon that could be examined for microbes. To compensate for this uncertainty, a tremendous amount of money and resources were spent on ensuring that the Apollo astronauts wouldn't spread their germs to the moon and any possible germs within the moon wouldn't come back and cause a pandemic on Earth. The reasons why this was such a public concern initially stemmed from three individuals, a pair of science fiction authors and an ambitious geneticist named Joshua Lederberg. H.G. Wells' 1898 seminal science fiction book War of the Worlds was about a race of hostile Martians that were more or less invincible when pitted against human weapons of the era, but were miraculously decimated by bacteria before completing their extermination plans. When a then 23-year-old thespian prodigy Orson Welles adapted the story to a radio play set in New Jersey in 1938, it supposedly caused a wide-scale panic throughout the broadcast's reach, though, as we've covered before, that panic, as often told, never actually happened, despite quotes from even Wells himself and sensationalized news reports since. In short, almost everybody knew that it was an entertainment broadcast, not least of which was because they explicitly said it throughout the broadcast. Also, exceptionally few people listened in, in the first place, and it was already a familiar story to most who listened. For full details, you can see our video on the topic. Moving on from there, Ray Bradbury's 1950 book, The Martian Chronicles, is a collection of short stories and has a chapter where the Martians are undone in their efforts to resist colonization by human astronauts with a bout of smallpox. Bradbury intended his story partially as a parable of human folly by introducing the idea that Earthlings would be more harmful to Martians than how sci-fi typically presented the dynamic at the time. Clearly, this was more based on historic models than what might actually affect aliens with potentially very different biological makeup, but that doesn't mean the scientific community wasn't treating these ideas as grave concerns during the earlier stages of our space age. On this note, Stanford University geneticist Joshua Lederberg started lobbying the scientific community as early as November of 1957 to consider the capacity of living organisms to grow and spread throughout a new environment. A month earlier, the Soviet space satellite Sputnik was launching the space race and Lederberg was a big part of the conversation on what to do next. His warnings prompted the National Academy of Sciences to create a committee in February 
February of 1958, called the International Council of Scientific Unions, which created yet another committee, the Committee on Contamination by Extraterrestrial Exploration, CTEX. These would be the first of two of a great many committees over the next decade that would make Kafka proud. It was here that the scientific community first laid out the potential risks of space exploration. Science had advanced enough so that the general consensus was that a nearly airless celestial body couldn't support life. Still, some scientists, including a not yet famous upstart Carl Sagan, entertained the remote possibility that there might be some kind of microorganisms present. Scientists also concluded that though there was likely no life on the moon in the present day, the committee's stance was that, to quote, some processes might have been taking place on the moon that could eventually, in the right environment, lead to the formation of life. The committee reasoned that if such processes were going on, then they could be seriously upset through lunar exploration. In his book When Biospheres Collide, Michael Meltzer noted, The moon's atmosphere contained such little matter, estimated at only 10 to 100 tons, that the release of tons of volatile material from a flyby spacecraft's operations, such as the setting of explosives for marking purposes, was likely to alter the moon's atmosphere for a very long time. In other words, the moon was seen as a highly important scientific artifact, and there was a danger of altering it. Like today, not everyone was on board with the safety first agenda. Geneticist Norman Horowitz, who later pioneered various experiments on Mars, hypothesized that for space exploration to be a biological danger to humans, three factors would have to be in play. Number one, microorganisms would need to exist on other planets. Number two, they would need to prove dangerous to humans. And number three, human technology would need to be unable to stop their spread. According to him, the probability of all three happening was minute enough that, to quote, I would be willing to run the risk involved in a premature return trip if a less bold schedule meant that the sample of Martian soil could not be brought back to Earth in my lifetime. He went so far as to say that even if bat contamination existed, the costs in time and money outweigh the benefits, and cited Christopher Columbus's voyage. According to Horowitz, if Europeans had known that Columbus's crew would bring back plagues to Spain, they might have cancelled the voyage and would never have reaped the benefit. Lederber further reasons that we are in a better position than Columbus was to have our cake and eat it too. Meanwhile, the issue of bat contamination, trips to space infecting us, was capturing the public imagination to greater level. Raised on War of the Worlds in the Martian Chronicles, a new generation of reporters started covering the field of exobiology and sparking the public imagination. A 1962 Time magazine article entitled Dangers from Space reported, Last week, Lockheed Aircraft Corporation announced that it has a team of scientists hard at work hoping to find a way to foil invasions of the Earth that may well start from space. The invaders most to be feared will not be little green Venusians riding in flying saucers or any of the other intelligent monsters imagined by science fictioners. Less spectacular but more insidious, the invaders may be alien microorganisms riding unnoticed on homebound Earth-built spacecraft. Another log on the fire was the publication of the book The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton just two months before the launch of Apollo 11 which led to a deluge of letters to NASA headquarters about the issue from a concerned public. NASA, having far more physicists and engineers in their ranks than biologists, might not have taken quarantine concerns seriously, but for public pressure and congressional oversight, so certain steps were enacted. The first step was to agree on a probability point. The SSB recommended that the probability of contamination should be no greater than 0.0001 to 0.01%. To solve this, the first step was mass sterilization. A lot of the best sterilization techniques were borrowed from pharmaceutical medical supplies and the food industry methods. Adaptations were made, however, because these sterilization techniques were for the atmosphere of Earth and the moisture therein. Thus, it was felt that new techniques called dry heat sterilization would have to be developed and implemented. Additionally, it was felt that procedures would need to be designed for the astronauts to carefully scoop up the moon rocks and the astronauts themselves would need to undergo training called the CDC. In fact, beyond shedding weight, this was partially the reason that so much equipment, like their backpacks and shoe coverings, were left on the moon. Further, while the astronauts were on the moon, the lunar module was made to circulate the gas through a lithium hydroxide filter. It was estimated that the filtering would need to be conducted for five hours, and that it would be a lot easier than on Earth, where the particulate matter might cling to surfaces. In space, the particles would float around in the middle of the capsule. The end result is that by the time the astronauts got back to the capsule, they were able to enjoy some very fresh air. It was eventually decided that after sterilizing NASA's space transportation equipment, a facility would need to be created to handle the moon rocks and astronauts on their return. In order to preserve the rocks, NASA would create a specialized chamber with one-tenth of a millionth the atmosphere of Earth to preserve any loosely bonded gases that might have bonded against moon rock, in addition to ensuring that reactions wouldn't happen between these rocks and the atmosphere. The astronaut facility would be everything at once, a sterile environment, a laboratory workspace for over a hundred biologists and geologists, and a living space. The moon rocks were even held in a laboratory 50 to 80 feet underground so that they'd be immune from most cosmic radiation. On top of that, every piece of paper, 
leaving this facility would be exposed to a sterilizing gas, ethylene oxide, for 16 hours. Moving on from there, there needed to be a way to get the astronauts from the Pacific Ocean to the LRL. Initially, the scientists thought to take a section of the USS Hornet, the ship entrusted for the recovery, and disease-proof it. However, they realized that this would only be the first of many stages between the Pacific Ocean and the lab in Houston, Texas, and they would then have to disease-proof the next thing that the ship would unload them off into, and the thing after that, etc. Another problem was that installing a quarantine unit in a ship would involve the ship being docked at a shipyard for longer than ideal when it was an active duty. The solution was to create a separate facility that could be moved from the USS Hornet to various other forms of transportation, much like an intermodal container that gets loaded off and on container ships. The six-ton structure that resulted would come to be known as the Mobile Quarantine Facility, designed to run off three separate forms of power for the 88-hour journey back from the deck of the USS Hornet to Johnson Space Center in Houston. Among many other features, it contains things like a kitchen which allowed for some semi-home-cooked meals. The three Apollo 11 astronauts and the two NASA specialists also enjoyed some company in the form of physician William Carpentier and technician John Hirasaki. These two would help ensure that the specialized MQF would remain in operation and that the astronauts' vital signs were being properly monitored. Carpentier and Hirasaki's grand prize for being footnotes in history was to be quarantined along with the Apollo 11 crew as the five people shared their airspace for that time. Furthermore, NASA arranged a number of doctors on hand in case any more drastic procedures needed to be conducted. Of course, any doctors who were summoned would also then be quarantined after. Over the course of this quarantine, the astronauts even held a press conference through glass partitions that was depicted in the 2018 film First Man. As for the decision over when to release the astronauts, that was up to the International Committee on Back Contamination, which had the authority to override mission control. And so it was that at 1 a.m. on August 11, 1969, a little over 12 days after they entered the lunar receiving facility and 26 days since liftoff, the crew was allowed to return to civilian life. But for all that effort, did the crew and capsule preserve a perfect quarantine? Well, not exactly. When the command module splashed down onto the Pacific Ocean, divers surfaced onto the capsule, briefly opened the door, and threw in a set of new biosuits for the astronauts to wear when they walked out onto the deck of the USS Hornet. Additionally, when the command module capsule was lifted onto the USS Hornet, the hatch was opened. It's not any sort of secret, as anyone can see it directly. So while the astronauts were quarantined and didn't have any contact with the atmosphere, the inside of the capsule itself was directly exposed to the atmosphere and vice versa. So what happens? It was initially recommended by the Back Contamination Committee that the command module carry a filter that would eliminate 99.9% .9 of bacteria, but that would also reduce the atmosphere circulation rate and lead to discomfort for the astronauts. As it stood, they must have been cutting the comfort level close because Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins, as noted in When Biospheres Collide, expressed concern that they had just about reached their level of tolerance. So what ended up resulting in this quarantine was a compromise, striking a balance between practicality and the overall goal of decontamination. Last we checked, we haven't been conquered by any moon-based diseases, so things seem to have worked out. As for the lunar receiving lab itself, it has occupied a space at Johnson Space Center, now known as Building 37, and has fallen into a state of neglect over the years. After the Apollo missions, it was used to collect lunar samples and then as a scientific facility. Although it is on the National Register of Historic Places, it was slated for demolition in 2020 in favor of a more environmentally friendly building. NASA scientist and historian Judith Hayes, who gave the author of this piece a personal tour of the building pre-pandemic, stated of this demolition, I think a vital history of NASA will be lost because many of the people working at Johnson today don't have a direct connection to that era of NASA. Pieces from the labs were put on display, however, and ironically, because of the present pandemic, the demolition has been delayed. And now for some bonus facts. The quarantining process for the astronauts also occurred with the next two missions to the moon, but after that, NASA deemed quarantine unnecessary, so the last Apollo 9 astronauts in the program were spared the inconvenience. At the start of this piece, we mentioned that the astronauts didn't get to go home immediately or meet their families. They also didn't go to the White House to meet the president. Fortunately, President Nixon came to them, as has been famously documented. Additionally, the crew was treated to a 45-day celebratory tour in which they traveled to 25 countries, headlined ticker tape parades in Chicago, New York, and LA, and were honored with a state dinner at the White House. And now for another bonus fact. Astronauts still have had quarantine procedures in current times. Seven days before launch, astronauts are formally quarantined, which gives enough time for physicians to detect viruses. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor, Manscaped. And thank you for watching.